Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Above the Haze. I'm Eric Postow, attorney of Parlatory Law Group. With me today, Dustin Hawksworth, founder and creator of Fat Nugs Magazine. Uh, it's a magazine for cannabis and stoner culture, but really its purpose is to be a bridge between the cannabis world and the rest of the world uh, so to help overcome a lot of the stigma, misinformation, misunderstandings, and just get us to the next uh, phase of life where cannabis is just a normal interwoven piece of society. It isn't really this outlier uh, in any sense. Dustin, thanks so much for being with me. Uh, and to the audience, uh, Dustin is my first guest. Uh, when I started these series back in 2021, uh, really focused on the interview uh, aspects of things, talking to people in the industry. And I wanted to get back to that in 2023 and really introduce uh, uh, our audience to all the wonderful people that make up this industry. So Dustin, thank you very much for being my first guest uh, in our, uh, our, our reformatted interview series. Uh, so welcome to the show. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And the way that you described the magazine was perfect. So I definitely appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, you know, I've had a chance to get to know Fat Nugs Magazine, and, and I, I see, uh, at least from the outside, uh, you guys really have the intention of going inside the industry, talking to people who make it up, and focusing on a lot of voices that may otherwise get overlooked in uh, traditional corporate America. I've seen a focus on women's issues, uh, social equity as a component, and really not shying away from a lot of different hard to talk about subjects. So what, what, what generates that? Why, why the focus on the cannabis industry? Why Fat Nugs Magazine? Why is this important? <laughs> um, oh man, that's lots of loaded questions, man. And, and lots of information that I could give you. Uh, I think let's uh, take a look at the cannabis industry and what it should be first. And, th and that's really the most inclusive place that could ever exist because Cannabis is consumed or used or whatever you want to call it uh, by every walk of life, um, nearly every age, probably much earlier than we should be uh, consuming and all the way up till, you know, people are on their deathbed, to be honest with you. So cannabis is sort of that um, that line of things that runs in between all of us. It connects all of us in some way. So I think the cannabis industry itself should be the most inclusive place that exists when it comes to industry period. So that's, that's kind of what, um, you know, really what this is all about, but the magazine itself, the publication itself, the independent cannabis publication itself really comes from, um, it started in my childhood, to be honest with you, and, and my connection with the plant and where all of that comes from. Um, I have 22 family members that are either current or former military. Uh, and when people were, when my family was coming back from Vietnam, there were a lot of PTSD issues. Um, we didn't know it was PTSD back then, <clears throat> but now that we do know, you know, what that looks like, it's obvious. Uh, so weed, let's call it what it was. Weed was smoked in my family on a daily basis. It was consumed, uh, just like anything else. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. It was completely normalized, normalized. So as my, uh, my earliest childhood memories, um, really are occupied by a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of weed culture, so to speak, where everybody gets together and smokes and, and they're really treating their health issues while also enjoying the plant. So again, very much normal in my family. I saw it yeah. regularly. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great like inflection point though. Your uh, relationship to the plant uh, started off childhood being around family members who didn't do it in secret. Correct. Who did it in an open environment as if it was a normal part of everyday life within the family. And I think that's actually kind of novel. I, I, I don't think that that's a common experience for a lot of folks. I think a lot of folks more come from the, this was a very personal uh, experience with cannabis for me and my consumption, and I would do it on my time. And that integrating into my family actually caused a lot of stress because they didn't understand. Yeah. Uh, so here you are, uh, the, the medicinal value 
but also the communal family thing that's happening. Uh, what, yeah, what, and are your, what are your I, thoughts on just that? Yeah, I think it, it created a space for me to, as I grew, uh, to realize the importance of it without it ever being an issue. There were no, uh, I didn't worry about stigma. There was none of that. Um, like I never, in the seventies, things were just a little different. Uh, there was, there was really none of the pushback from cannabis use, to be honest with you. I mean, every, I thought every, at least in my mind, it, it just created a place where I thought it was normal for everyone, I guess. And I didn't question it. I know I didn't question it. That's the thing. Cause as a kid, when you see your aunts and your uncles and, 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 you know, everyone else enjoying themselves with friends and other family, it's just something that is. So I think that profoundly affected my ability to be um, independent thinking when it comes to cannabis and not listen to the rhetoric that we dealt with from the 80s and the, the dare shit um, and the you know, all of the stuff that we've been fed really for the past hundred years, but really since, you know, my time in the, in the seventies, all the way up from the eighties and nineties in my childhood, none of that negative soaked into my brain. It never got past, yeah. you know, that barrier. So I think what it did as far as me growing up with it normalized and, and I, I didn't share this with you yet, you know, for, for nine years, I also had a, an indigenous stepfather. So he was also a consumer. And let's just say I saw a plant or two around the house. So there were multiple times with multiple family members throughout my life that the plant was always being consumed and normalized. So I, I can remember times when my brother and I were sitting in the back seat and my parents were, were driving and passing a joint back and forth in the car. It just was, it was no right. different than anything else. Now, do I condone that kind of stuff? Maybe, maybe not, but, that's, that is what it, it just is what it is. So again, it was very normal. And I think that had a very profound effect on me being where I am today, which is building a cannabis and stoner culture publication. And so there's a, there's a few things I want to break out here. One, this is a great opportunity to get into that bridging thing because your world did clash with the rest of the world at some point. And I want to get into that, but I also want to get into the, the importance of words. Uh, both of our, our career paths, our professional lives, has a lot to do with words, how they're used, the meaning, the cultural context, uh, the legal significance. Uh, I, I, I wonder if you could maybe just spend a couple of minutes thinking about words with me. And, and I'm, I approach it like this. You, ra you were raised calling it weed. I called it weed, called it bud. Um, and hot and marijuana always felt like it was not the right word it felt like a negative word it felt pejorative now we understand the racialized history of marijuana but i wonder what your your take on the importance of words and and um especially in, in what you do it with uh, fat nudge magazine this is an easy one for me so first of all i'm not a word police so to speak um, I want people and, and cannabis is very personal to everyone. And I want everyone to feel comfortable with their, you know, vocalizations of cannabis, weed, pot, marijuana, ganja, whatever the hell you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and even though marijuana has sort of and I think we need to make sure we're, we're in uh, the audience is in full under understanding of where the word really came from to begin with. It was something that, um, you know, the Mexican culture used, you know, before we sort of place the negative stamp on it <clears throat> the way that we did. So there are people um, in our country now that, uh, you know, use that word on a regular basis because it's what they were always used to from their own culture, from a Hispanic or a, a Mexican culture. Um, yeah. So it's not, that word has not always been racially charged. We, sort of look at it as a racially charged word here because of the stigma that uh, some very idiotic folks, uh, you know, put their put their stamp on it, right? They're, they're the ones that started to do the whole reefer madness thing and really connect the, that word to a lot of the reefer madness stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but, 
But when it comes to any words or, or you know, vernacular that we use uh, when it comes to cannabis and, and, you know, true stoner and cannabis culture, it's all about knowing your audience, right? So if we're educating people these days, uh, you know, a lot of it is cannabis. When you're hanging out with your friends, it's probably weed or, you know, that's some nice bud or look at those fat nugs, right? So <laughs> it, it really depends on your audience and knowing your audience and being open to, you know, everyone's views on those words. And you have to remember that, again, there are multiple cultures around the world that use that word marijuana. And it has no no negative connotation whatsoever. And we also have to remember Absolutely. that there are amazing uh, organizations in cannabis that ha that use the word marijuana in their names. So normal, for instance, you know that that's mm -hmm. obvious. That's an obvious one. So there are you know several things to consider. Sure, when it comes to the the words that we use. But you also have to um, be open enough and not so rigid when it comes to cannabis because it's so personal. So being open to, to I, I love I love the way you put that, and it makes a lot of sense, and actually kind of allows us to go deeper into the bridging concept of your magazine because this this plant is so personal and yet so universal. Uh, so it is us, um, but at the same time, it is not us. Uh, and so that that's where the bridge is. Uh, so why is it so important for people like you to not just cater to your industry, but to cater to the broader community in helping uh, bridge dis under, uh, disagreement, misunderstandings, different understandings, uh, integrating perspective, you know, moving us yeah. all... Trans transcending where we are now. Yeah, I, I think it's, in, well, and again, it's around being open and um, not so rigid and closed-minded to, to other people and the way that they think about cannabis. And so when you are approaching anyone and speaking about the plant, the important things, it's not so much I don't want to say so much, you know, perfect wording. It's more being able to connect with someone on a personal level. You can speak to them about cannabis or weed or pot or marijuana or grass or, and, and, or whatever you want to call it. As long as it's in a way that you are, at least in my opinion, you need to be uplifting, positive and helpful when it comes to speaking about the plant, right? If you're going to be educating someone, making sure that you're educating correctly. Um, those are the things that are important. And I think we have to realize that everyone, it, just as, as, as different as the plant is from cultivar to cultivar or strain <clears throat> to strain or variety to variety, whatever you want to call it, that's another one of those words in the industry that people, you know, sometimes cringe with, the word strain. Well, guess what? We've been using it for a long time and it's okay, but it's also you, also perfectly fine to use variety or cultivar. So, you know, it's one of those things that the plant is so different <clears throat> and there's so many different things from within the plant itself that make it different from the next plant. And from the bottom node to the top node of the plant, it's completely different. And so if you just look at cannabis that way, and then also look at, you know, being a human and your own humanity and treating people with that thought in mind that, that uh, you know, each and every person is also extremely different, even though we have some of the same experiences and have the same backgrounds, we all experience life very different. So just really when it comes to cannabis and speaking about it and, and using specific wording and vernacular and whatever you want to call it, it's really just about being respectful and open and honest and, and, and helpful and supportive. That's what it's about. Yeah. When Did you, I go on a tangent? You, Did I go on my stoner tangent there? <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it was great. Um, uh, when when you have to confront uh, uncomfortable truths about either the plant or the industry, what's your approach? 
Well, I guess it would probably depend on that uncomfortable truth. And, and a lot of it, um, it's very rare for me to see or hear anything specifically about the plant itself that is negative. There's almost nothing that you can tell me about the plant that is that I can perceive as a negative. Um, I really don't. I'm one of those true believers. It, I just, I just am. And I think because of my background, that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. But the uncomfortable truths about the industry, I think are a daily thing that we run into, right? Where um, it's not as inclusive as we want it to be. The states don't know what the fuck they are doing. Excuse my language. Um, Amen. You know, the the let the the people that are building our laws and making our regulations don't really give a flying rat's ass about us. It's not about the small uh, mom and pop women equity legacy and traditional owned cannabis businesses and in, in, in smaller voices. That's that's really been, I think, the underlying issue of a lot of things that go on in the industry that make us go, what the hell is going on? Why is this happening? Um, and it's because we have rules, laws, regulations, whatever you want to call it, being, you know, conjured up by people that have no clue what they're doing when it comes to the plant. They do understand how to make money and how to make markets work in their favor. They don't understand the plant and the people and the culture surrounding it. So I think a lot of those uncomfortable truths that you are, you know, well aware of, you know, how do I confront those or combat those? Um, it's just by being open, just like you and I are talking right now. I, I have no problem calling out, you know, sort of bad players, excuse me, bad players in this industry or our lawmakers overall or having hard conversations that need to be had with anyone and everyone. And there are so many of those conversations that we can have about every portion of the industry itself that on a daily basis, if we really wanted to, we could be confronting something, right? Sure. Sure. Um, I totally hear you. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And I think that from a, a journalistic perspective, that's probably a great um, approach. You know, and, and you know you what be, you want to be trusted for your your editorial judgment and so if yep. you're if you're honest in what you're looking at and how you're approaching things and if there's things that look weird and you say this looks weird that's that's a credibility builder you know you can't please everybody all the time but you can be honest all the time yeah and you know what that's um i'm glad you said that because it reminded me of, of another way that we combat sort of industry stuff um, or talk about industry stuff. And yeah, it's absolutely being um, open, honest, and transparent, but it's really giving our writers the freedom to write about the things that they're passionate about, the things that they love. And so you get a lot of natural, and because of our writers are connected to this plant, because they've been connected to this culture, have been around this plant, have lost people because you know, the plant hasn't been available to family members or whatever the case may be. There is something very personal to them about the plant. So they speak from the heart. They're not here trying to make money or to to please someone that has given us money and puppeteering what it is that they're saying. It's all about being honest and being able to speak your truth as a cannabis consumer. And I think that's a natural way of being able to combat a lot of negative things as far as stigma or anything else that's going on. So, Dustin, Fat Nugs Magazine. Obviously, we know what it's about. Well, what goes into it? Oh, goodness. Uh, lots and lots of time, lots of creative work uh, and a lot of teamwork, too, which is really cool. But the, the magazine itself really comes from... Uh, things from my childhood and it comes from kind of three publications that I loved and, and saw a lot of when I was growing up. So I was a skater punk when I was a kid. Uh, so Thrasher magazine was always something that was kind of near and dear to my heart. There's nothing like seeing somebody do a big twist and that being a, a double page layout. And I was like, Oh man, that's really cool. So Thrasher magazine was, was definitely something uh, that this comes from mad magazine. So I'd be walking through the grocery store with my mom, and I can remember looking at the the, the the magazine stand and seeing Mad Magazine and 
the the big eared freckled red haired guy always caught my attention and, and so the visuals of that magazine being always very silly and and uh you know comedy i guess uh really caught my eye and caught my attention and then the third one the third publication would be early high times right 70s 80s uh early 90s high times sort of before kind of all the big changes that have happened um and that's really where the publication in my mind uh I would like to be able to, you know, represent those things. Now, since we are a, a cannabis and stoner culture publication that is built to be a bridge to the rest of the world, the way that we do things um, is very global. We have writers from all over the place, from mm -hmm. Kenya, Ireland, Scotland, Spain, Bermuda, India, Canada, of course, here in the U.S. And I think I'm probably missing a couple as well. So you get a global perspective of cannabis and stoner culture. We get to learn about things that are going on in Africa when it comes to cannabis. Um, things like Spanibus. I have a, a writer in uh, Spain that'll be covering Spanibus this year. So it's a really cool thing that we get to have all of these different writers from all over the world talking about cannabis. Um, how they came to be a part of the magazine itself is a really interesting thing. So I've built this magazine purely by community support. I have no money. We make no money. None of us have ever made any money here off of this publication, and we still don't. Now, that will change in the future. We're growing this next publication, this next edition that actually comes out tomorrow, paid for itself, which is the first time in a year that I didn't have to come out of pocket for, for building an edition, which is a pretty cool thought. Um, That's your February, February issue, February 3rd. Yep, correct. So um, we are growing. We'll get to that point where we do have money and we'll be a publication, hopefully, uh, around filling gaps within the industry for years to come. But the community really stepped up because when I first started this thing about a year ago, what happened was I was I've always been someone who's been fairly creative. I have written and released three albums on my own. I do some painting, blah, blah, blah. So I'm always looking for sort of that creative dump it's pretty natural for me to sit around and get stoned and, and create things. And so one day I started creating uh, a magazine cover and I said, you know, what, what would be a good name? And, you know, from our stoner conversations, right. It's that's a fat joint. That's a fat blunt. That's a fat sack. Those are fat nugs. And there we go. That's kind of how the name came about. I checked around, made sure it didn't exist. There is a publication out there. I believe it's in California. It's a little, I, I believe it's a local publication called Nugs, but nothing called Fat Nugs. So I took it and ran with it and really started to um, bring my, so I, I spent 14 years in corporate America doing um, customer experience, customer data, consumer insights, and ran a lot of programs for companies like Apple, Abercrombie & Fitch, Home Depot, Lowe's, CenturyLink, and the list goes on and on. And so I started to, and then of course, me growing up with the plant, I also ended up running pounds from Atlanta, Georgia, down to Georgia Southern University when I was in college. And that's how um, I got my, or, or mostly paid for my, uh, my education. So again, the plant has always been around, always been normalized, always used it, consumed it in some way. Um, so <laughs> really it was, this magazine really was about me being able to bring all of my experiences from both the corporate side and me growing up around the plant with the plant and combining those things in a way that I could connect with people on several different levels, both from a plant perspective and from sort of, a, um, um, I guess, a knowledge of how businesses can run or should be run in my view. Um, so we do things that are very transparent here. I share everything with everyone that is on the team. Um, we have new writers and people join when they want to. They And of course, we, we do vetting and, and all of that stuff and, and make sure that we have great people um, writing for us. But at the same time, we allow people to come to us, talk to us, introduce themselves, talk to them, talk to us and tell them, tell us their story about their connection with the plant. And so a lot of our writers come from, again, the culture side of things and want to be able to share all of their knowledge and experience with as many people as we can. How we do that is 
we can do some very science and education based stuff. That's great. I love doing it. And it's always good to be able to teach your audience things. But a lot of times when, depending on who you're speaking to, who your audience is, you have to be able to connect with them in a different way. Speaking about cannabis education and scientifically only, you can really turn blue in the face and, and you know, and, and talk and talk and talk and people will kind of tune you out. So the best thing to do is to be able to connect with them on a personal level. Science and education, yes, but to run a personal story through those things, through those types of writings is the best way to connect with other people that may not necessarily know what the culture is, understand cannabis, are, are can of curious, so to speak, that kind of stuff. And it's introducing and talking about the plant to them in a way that says, yeah, here's some education and science stuff that's really cool and that we all love. But my child, who is two years old at home, he takes a, a, a broad spectrum product to, to keep his seizures away at night. Or my grandmother at 85 years old smokes a joint because her hips have are, are you know broken or whatever the case may be, right? So if you put those personal stories out in front of people that are also teaching them things about the plant and sharing the plant in a very positive and uplifting way, that is the best way that I've learned that we can connect people to this plant in a very meaningful way so that they're not just concerned about, you know, it, uh, business is coming into their, uh, into their neighborhood. Um, people being stoned all the time and driving and, um, you know, it creating, having the plant being, uh, you know, out in the open and normalized and talked in a way that they can connect with it creates all of the difference that we need to really bring this plant into the place in our society that it belongs. That's what this magazine is. That's what it's for. That's what we're here to do. And that's how we do it. Having amazing sort of very, very inclusive, a very inclusive environment where we encourage everyone to bring their passion and their love and their creativeness so that they can speak to the audience about cannabis in the best way that connects themselves to it and the plant to their audience. And that's what we do. I would like to just ask about one current event and then uh, shift towards some up, uplifting and optimism for the industry. Cool. Uh, but the current event, the increasingly clear conflict or potentiality for conflict between the hemp, industrial hemp, however we want to label it, the intoxicating hemp, and then the regulated cannabis uh, marketplace participants, and then broadly, holistically, as, 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 a, as part of the same ecosystem, what are your thoughts on where we're at and what would you like to see happen? Well, once again, I, I look to our lawmakers who have really screwed up a lot, um, and they've separated cannabis because of one single compound which is, or one single thing within the plant, one cannabinoid, THC. And because of THC, um, we have all of these differing regulations and things that are and are not okay. It's completely asinine. Um, the overall look of, of, of what we should be doing, I mean, the, the really how we solve, and I think all of us know this, how we solve the real issues that a lot of farmers, producers, businesses um, face is all because of the scheduling, right? We've got to deschedule. If we can simply deschedule, none of this is an issue. The interstate commerce isn't a fucking issue. You know, this, this whole trying to keep THC levels down because of a certain whatever is ridiculous, let it, cannabis is it all it's all cannabis right cannabis is hemp hemp is cannabis it's all the same plant it's all the same plant regulating it differently because of one single thc thing one thing is makes zero sense it really does and to make people jump through hoops and to ruin people's lives because of it or to make a industry completely run um backwards and everybody have to do these 
special things and pay these special fees and extra taxes and all this stuff that everybody has to deal with. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. It's great that we have a little bit of movement towards, you know, normalization, I guess, legalization in some form. But a lot of it is destroying a lot of small businesses or really just keeping people out of the industry, period. When you have regulations that are being or laws being written by very wealthy individuals connected to lawmakers and there's, you know, back alley deals and people being paid off and going to jail for it, truly, and some other things like that that are going on in the industry. We have created a monster that is next to impossible to get a hold of and be a business that is successful just like any other business, like a dry cleaning business, like a restaurant, mm -hmm. like a, you know, something. It's, it's a bit ridiculous. I think we all know. Um, and how we truly solve it is by getting out of the fucking way, descheduling it, quit with the racist bullshit. We all know that we're, we're in this spot because of very dumb, racist, wealthy white people that wanted to own industries and keep certain races down in the country. That's why we're still dealing with ridiculous laws that make no sense. So as a country, we should absolutely be looking at ourselves and going, none of these laws should have fucking been here to begin with. Why are we doing this? And get mm. rid of it and mm. let the plant be as it is. Let us grow our own medicine Stop trying to take people's rights away with um, Prohibition 2.0 and allowing companies to use their wealth to manipulate lawmakers into getting rid of home, home grow and caregiver rights. You know, so again, it's, it's, it's like business is normal here in our capitalistic free for all, which is not a free for all unless you're extremely wealthy. There is no free market. There is none of that good stuff for the small players in this space. Um, and we all suffer because of it. We suffer on quality. We suffer mm. with our businesses. We suffer with our families. We see farmers going out of business that have been doing this for decades. It's disgusting and I hate it. So hopefully we can get to something positive here in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I appreciate the energy. Uh, and the passion with which you, you speak about the issues. Um, but let's get to the positive because, yeah, there's still problems and it's an emerging, you know, regulated space, um, whether it should be regulated or it should be something else. All we can deal with is what is and what's coming. Uh, and there still is a lot of, uh, of, of reason to be hopeful and, and optimistic, I think, uh, for people that will find opportunities uh, to make something of themselves in this this uh, new marketplace, uh, for entrepreneurs to be industrial and to, to build really interesting brands and companies and, and uh, for folks to find uh, a pathway towards uh, healing in a way that they've, they've been missing out on, uh, potentially. Um, so I, I see a lot of, of, the, of the positive things happening and coming. What do you see? I see the same. I mean, we have the big thing about this industry is that 99.9% .9 of the people are happy to be here, loving, supportive, want the industry to succeed, love the community, love the plant. A lot of people really like what we're doing. Overall, we are moving forward, albeit slow. But we are moving forward. I see businesses that are doing amazing things. I see states full of businesses doing amazing things, making money hand over fist, having great success. So there are a lot of really cool, positive, uplifting things going on in the industry for sure. And it's more positive than negative when it comes to the aspect of the actual industry itself, the negative stuff is on the outside. It's on the periphery. They're the ones that are making the laws and the rules and the regs that are kind of, you know, keeping all of us trying to jump over hurdle, you know, every hurdle, every single day, a new hurdle every day yeah. somewhere. Yeah. But the positives far outweigh the negative. 
and a lot of it is based yeah. on the people. We have some amazing people in this place. I mean, you know, there people like you. There are other, um, there are other very sharp, very intelligent, well connected people in this space who are trying to do the right things and trying to bring change so that all of the businesses that are in this space, all of the voices and the people that are in this space have a place and can continue to grow and build in the way that any other business can in any other industry. Yeah. And we do see some of that. We do have, a, we do have that. Is it, is it enough yet? No. I think we also have a, a few players in the industry that hold a lot of the wealth. Um, and, and that, uh, will slowly change. We've seen some companies pull out of three states earlier this this week, I believe it was, with Cura Leaf pulling out of Oregon, California, and Colorado. Um, and what that does, it, th that type of thing is a win for the industry mm. I, I um, mm -hmm. overall, because you know a, a player like Cura Leaf, uh, Boris, and he he's he's been on. Um, record calling for, you know, consolidation and, you know, really a handful of giants owning the industry. I couldn't think of a worse thing. <laughs> I really couldn't. We'd all be smoking dirt. We'd all be smoking corporate boof for a hundred dollars an eighth. And it's just it, it, like they do in some States already, uh, for, uh, Florida, truly. Um, anyway, so there are, um, again, there are a lot of great things, a lot of great companies. The people overall are absolutely amazing. The stories in this space are what make everything. The stories that people have gone through in their lives to get to the point that they are within the industry and being able to be here will blow your mind. And I get to have those conversations and, and read and write and talk about those stories on a daily basis with my team. Uh, and it's absolutely amazing to to really be able to experience people's lives before they got into the industry, even though they've always had, most of them have always had some part of building the industry because of being a part of the legacy and traditional side of things. Wow. Uh, Dustin, uh, really amazing conversation. Uh, in closing, uh, if you could summarize the cannabis culture today in a word, what would your word be? Whew. Uh, that's a really good one. I think the culture itself is really described best by respect. The word respect. It's, it's, and you can put that word in front of a lot of things. So respecting our farmers, right? Respecting um, our, our hippie culture that helped push us um, in, in, in through the sixties who also battled back against Nixon and, and, um, you know, his start of the drug war. Um, it's about respecting the people that really got us here and got us our medicine, our caregivers, um, the people who have taken it upon themselves to grow our medicine, even though they could have been thrown in jail and, and uh, many of them have been and lost everything, lost their families, lost their homes, their vehicles. And we still see this today. I, I saw a, a ridiculous post by a Ringgold County, Georgia uh, department where they were happy they busted a guy with some dabs and took his car and took his all, all his possessions and his, and his money. And, and I was just like, you know, we're still dealing with this stuff. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> so a lot of it, if... And, and if it's not about respect, it should be. We should be understanding the history of how we got here. Respecting our, really our elders, our, our, our family members, our parents, our grandparents, and them passing along their knowledge of the plant, sharing it, um, creating some sort of normalization somewhere in this country. There's a lot of respect there. And I think that's really how you define what cannabis culture is. It's, it's really about respect. Amen. All right, Dustin, 
Thanks so much for joining us today on Above the Haze. Um, I'm Eric Postow. Stay tuned to the next episode.